Oh, I'm so excited for the seminar. Dude, me too. I can't wait for it to start. Same. Wait, how did you get here? Oh. I teleported. I heard that y'all are here for my seminar. That's perfect. I'm Dr. T and have all the tea on politics. Yeah, so we heard about a hate crime in the news recently. Yeah, and we wanted to know people who go through hate crimes if they're protected at the federal level. Yeah. I'm glad you asked. In 1998, two events happened that would launch hate crime legislation into the political agenda. The first was Matthew Shepard. He was targeted for his sexual orientation and then left to die. The second was James Byrd. In that same year, he was targeted for three miles by a pickup truck and dragged through the town and then left to die at a cemetery by three white supremacists. These two things made sure that hate crimes became part of the national conversation. And so what was done about this? That's a good question, my young Padawan. So, the first point is that it now protects people based on sexual orientation. The second one is that under new law, it gives funding to both local and state to help prosecute hate crimes. And then the best part is, you don't have to be doing anything federally funded to be persecuted for hate crimes. So, now you don't have to vote or go to school. Now hate crimes can happen anywhere, at any time. Isn't that great? Oh, wow. That seems like a great bill to protect our citizens. It must have been real easy to pass. You would think it would be easy to pass, but it took eight years. Let's get into it. The bill was first introduced in the 107th Congress, but we don't care about the 107th Congress. It didn't go anywhere. So we're going to talk about the 108th and the 111th Congress when it actually passed. What? Two Congresses to pass? Wake up, it's two Congresses. Well, actually, it was five Congresses, but we're just going to be talking about these two. You see, in the 108th Congress, the bill was introduced by Rep Conyers, a Democrat of Michigan, with 178 co-sponsors, but it died in subcommittee. Yeah, I know. Tragic, really. And then, in the Senate, it was introduced by Senator Smith, a Republican from Oregon, as an amendment to the Defense Authorization Act of 2005, and it actually passed. Oh, oh, I know. It was removed in conference committee, right? Yeah. You must be one of Theron's kids. But anyway, back to the 111th Congress, when things actually got done. You see, at this point, Representative Conyers reintroduced the bill in the House, this time with 120 co-sponsors, and it actually passed. And now, bear with me, this is where it gets really complicated. The bill then went to the Senate, where it was introduced by Senator Kennedy, a Democrat from Massachusetts, but it died in the Senate. However, it was then reintroduced by Senator Leahy, a Democrat from Vermont, as an amendment to the Defense Authorization Act of 2010, where it actually passed. And then both of them came together in conference, and then... It landed on President Obama's desk, where it was signed. That's very interesting and all, but why did it pass in a Republican-controlled Senate, a Democratic-controlled Senate, but not in a Republican-controlled House? We're going to talk about pivot tables. If you see in the 108th Congress, we're bound by the confines of Senator Boxer, the most liberal senator with a score of negative 0.45, and Senator Allard, the most conservative senator with a score of 0.572. Now, if you look for our filibuster pivot, you see that it is with Senator Landrieu at negative 0.203, and with Senator Bond at 0.31 for the veto pivot. And that creates our gridlock region right here, which means that anything outside of that gridlock region will pass. Now, for the 111th Congress, we're bound by the confines of Senator Sanders, the most liberal senator, at negative 0.517, and Senator Thomas, the most conservative senator, at 0.782. Now, for the veto pivot, it's with Senator Casey at negative 0.3, and the filibuster pivot is with Senator Sean Earl Nelson at negative 0.03. This creates our gridlock zone right here, which means that the Senate amendment must have passed 
somewhere around here or somewhere around here. Point is, if that's outside of the gridlock zone, we can make sure that the amendment passes. That's cool and all, but why did it fail in the house? That's a good question. Really a lot of reasons. Some people thought it would infringe on the 14th Amendment. Other people said it would violate their religious liberties. But really more importantly, President Bush came out against it. And even if it made it through Congress, he would veto it. And the Republicans just didn't have the numbers to repeal that veto. Oh wow, I'm really glad I came to this seminar. I really learned a lot about hate crimes. Yeah, me too, it was awesome. Oh, that was great. Thank you. That's why I'm Dr. T, serving all the tea on politics.